And joining us now on the drum is Michael Ware. You probably just heard him there. He's a former <laughs> foreign correspondent with Time and CNN. He was for many years a frontline reporter in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. He acquired an intimate knowledge of the inner workings of al-Qaeda, sometimes too intimate. At one stage, he was kidnapped by al-Qaeda in Iraq. Michael, uh, great to see you. Thanks for coming on the drum. Yeah, good day, mate. Now... As a journalist, you're so interlinked with this story. You, you went to Afghanistan in, in 2001 to cover the, the hunt for bin Laden. What was your initial reaction when you heard the news that he'd been killed? Well, obviously, like everybody else who was outside of the military and uh, command information loop, I was taken quite by surprise, and clearly there was some delight. Um, but I must confess that the first blush of reaction that I had is still what's coursing through me, even sitting here right now, and... And that's a kaleidoscope of faces. Um, I don't know, for some reason with his capture, since then all I've been doing is, is seeing the faces of so many American boys I know who aren't with us anymore. But also uh, a number of Pakistanis, Afghans, Iraqis. Um, and that's just my dead. Um, so it's given me pause to reflect upon that. And of course that, that lends me to, to give broader reflection to what we're, we're at almost, what, 6,000 combat deaths from the, from the wars, hundreds of thousands of civilian deaths from one cause or another. So, yeah, it's really been a moment of, um, of, of quite some deliberation for me. What difference will it make to al-Qaeda losing Osama bin Laden? Well, look, I think we can all be um, agreed on the fact that this is a great symbolic body blow to the organisation, their titular head, their figurehead, the, the man who is inspired... Um, this particular vision of Al-Qaeda, this branding of the Al-Qaeda franchise, this McDonald terrorism. I mean, he's played this sort of um, inspirational role. Operationally, however, um, I think it leaves the command leadership pretty much untouched. I mean, from my dealings with Al-Qaeda operatives and, and those who work with them, my appreciation is that pretty much, I would guess, in September 9, 2001, with the assassination of Ahmed Shah Massoud, he knew what would be coming. So he's been the you know, spiritual leader in hiding on the run, while it's people like Ayman al dwahri and others who have been the day-to-day -day operational chiefs. Was, so, he still, was he still bringing money into al-Qaeda? Was he, in a sense, dispensable? Was, you know, was yeah, he... I, look, this is the other thing about al-Qaeda. No matter what it is he was and wasn't doing, al-Qaeda is an organisation built for loss. This is a, a terrorist organisation at war. Now, and they've proved over and over again their ability to replenish and to regenerate. They've lost untold foot soldiers, facilitators, bomb makers, particular areas of expertise, mid-ranking management, you know, high-ranking strategic thinkers, and yet they haven't laid down. So these guys are regenerating and regenerating. So whatever it is that Osama was doing, despite his distinguished status, is replaceable. Will they, use his, will they use his death to regenerate? Oh, without a shadow of a doubt. He's a great shaheed now. He's a martyr. Mm. Um, and, yeah. and even, got, even, and due to, even due to the circumstances of his because death? Because of the circumstances. Like, what, what about the bits of hiding behind a woman of being well, living in luxury? Well, do we know that was Osama? I haven't heard that. I know that one man... That's, is, that's what's come out today from US officials, but I'm assuming al-Qaeda people won't be believe I, that. Yeah, I mean, that will be tossed here and there and, and whatever. But at the end of the day... You know, this was a stunning success, a breathtaking operation for the American administration. I mean, you have Navy SEAL strike teams in a nighttime airborne assault unleashed from American bases in Afghanistan, punching through the night across the worst of the Pakistani badlands, going striking deep into Pakistani sovereign territory to put, for the first time that's been acknowledged, American boots on the ground since these wars began, and to take on the compound, and someone went in with a kill shot to the head and took out Osama bin Laden. Now, Al-Qaeda's got another version of that story, I'm sure. That their leader, dying as he lived, defying the infidel, refusing to surrender, going down in a blaze of glory against their crack troops. Now, you think you can't play that one? Yeah. I was going to say, isn't there a sense that the narrative that we've been told in the last years is that, you know, Osama was the you know, worst terrorist in the world, and yet now we find out, assuming this is true, 
This guy was in a compound with no phone, no internet, as supposedly the most dangerous man in the world. It's almost surreal and absurd that the media and politics have created this man as the worst person in the world, and yet the guy was living seemingly in luxury, and yet cut off from the world at the same time as well. Isn't that... Well, well, well for me, I mean, you know, I've always associated the term old school to Osama bin Laden. I mean, given all the American assets at the administration's play, I mean, the great strength and also its weakness has been reliance upon SIGINT and electronic um, surveillance and other forms of of um, information gathering. So I, I've said for many years, I can guarantee you one thing, Osama bin Laden wouldn't have a cell phone within 100 yards of him, mm -hmm. right? Um, internet, you've got to be joking. What's, he, what, what's his use of that? Plus, you know, it, as we see, it was you know, through this pair uh, who were first identified that the couriers, I mean, that's old school. You know, you're sending message, messages literally, man to man. Mm -hmm. And it's always been my assumption that you probably could have counted at various times on one hand the number of people who actually knew where Osama was sleeping tonight. Um, so I dare say certainly in the beginning years it would have shifted quite a lot. Mm. Um, that there would have been periods of living really quite rough. Who knows how long he's been here? Obviously for a period, but, you know, and the people who would have actually known where he was, like really known, um, to them $25 million would have meant nothing. Mm. These were people who weren't willing to die for him, were itching. To die for him. So, Michael, even though he used prehistoric communication methods, the, the Navy SEALs are saying that they seized a whole lot of computer drives from mm. inside that compound. Is there anything that's likely to be on that that could be intelligence that could be used to, well, to help you? Well, you know, I mean, let's put it this way. If ideally, obviously, presumably, would have been great to, to capture him, um, to interrogate him and exploit whatever um, information may or may not have come from him. You know, not to mention the enormous propaganda value. I mean, to have another Saddam Hussein disheveled hiding in a hole and then parade him around for the world to see until we laugh while we watch his execution, I mean, you know, couldn't write that one. Um, so, yeah, obviously the, the man's not just sitting there twiddling his thumbs, but um, I think that the probably getting those hard drives and whatever other materials were scooped up, that's going to be the greatest exploitation you could have hoped for anyway. You know, what you're going to get from him... Um, you know, any cell is decompartmentalised um, so that even if, if you and I get rolled up by the Americans, we don't even know you exist. Mm. So, and I'm sure they would have kept Osama in the same fashion. He would have just needed to know the broadest, most general um, guidelines, I would imagine. David Crow, you got a question for Michael? Yeah, I've been struck by going through the transcript coming out of the White House about how they were watching the operation in real time or at least, sorry, monitoring it in real time. And it's not clear how much video, how much imagery and how much audio they were getting from the people on the ground in the compound, but they were certainly getting some information. And Michael's made the point about um, the Al-Qaeda version of the story that we'll see over time. One way to rebut that would be to release some of the video and some of the uh, imagery if it exists. I'm curious about what Michael thinks about the impact of the release of of video or imagery of the, the operation. Well, uh, yeah, obviously, and, and that, that would, could potentially have enormous value for uh, the American side, but there's a number of factors to weigh against that. One is how much would that potentially compromise um, methodology and operational security going forward. Um, also, maybe he did get off a couple of angry shots, or he did make a little bit more of a defiant stand than anyone mm. would really like to have seen. Maybe there wasn't <coughs> really a woman and in yeah, front of him. There was another man in a burqa. Um, <laughs> Or, for example, um, I've, you know, it's not the first time that they've had um, helmet-mounted cameras no, no. and that mm. in the White House they've been sitting in there watching it blow by blow, right? I mean, I remember, for example, a great American success story in Iraq. Um, the only hostage, really, holders, bowlers, storm in and rescue him was American Roy Hallams, um, who was essentially buried underground for almost 11 months. And they finally got the great lead, and they sent in the teams, landed in essentially the paddy field, stormed the farmhouse. Now, the dude had a, a helmet-mounted camera, and Bush, George W. Bush was watching it blow by blow in the White House. We only have a fraction of the release of that. And yet that's such an un unadulterated good story. So clearly there's a lot of other factors that go into play the release of this material.
Yeah, there's there's definitely on all operators they'll have at least one mounted camera, and so every member of the team will. And in the situation room, you'll be able to actually see um, exactly what the operators see, and then you'll also have the satellite imagery for the larger scale operation. It's going to be monitored at every possible mm -hmm. facet. And so if if it were the case that um, they wanted to fight a propaganda fight, that could be selectively pulled out, edited, and displayed if yeah. necessary. YouTube um, wars. I look yeah. forward to that. <laughs> Michael, we we were talking before about Pakistan's role in this. How how was it that he could live in a in a city with a military academy down down the road? Down the road from West Point or Dunfermline? Yeah. How, how, is, how is it so? <laughs> well, I think we all know the goddamn answer to that one, yeah. don't we? Um, <laughs> we'll put it this way, you know, the Iraqi, um, oh sorry, the um, Pakistani Inter-Service Intelligence Agency, the ISI, I mean, they're our ally, both American and Australian. Um, and yeah, there's been some positive roles, but that's been a deeply problematic uh, relationship since the beginning of this whole affair. As we know, it's because of the ISI, be it its tacit support or otherwise, that the Taliban even has oxygen to breathe. Without those sanctuaries, there would be no Taliban. Now, the ISI even doesn't have to do anything to support the Taliban, just allow them into the frontier provinces. Um, and that's, that's like a win-win for them. Destabilise an Afghan client state, as they see it. Uh, Indian client state in Afghanistan, as they see it. But, you know, it's a very complex and long relationship that we're looking at here between Islamabad and DC. One example of many is um, an old friend of mine is a former director. I actually know a couple of directors, the former directors of the ISI. One is General Hamid Ghul. Um, now, he's widely credited as the godfather of the Taliban. Um, now, last time I visited him in his retirement um, was at his house in Rawalpindi, and um, I met one of his sons there, and he's an incredibly urbane, uh, elegant, sophisticated, extremely well-educated English speaker. He's a really likeable bloke. And we were just sitting around waiting for the father to come down, and we were just talking, and he was going through the, the war stories he had about when he was fighting the Russians as a young man, literally alongside Osama bin Laden. Right. So my question is, are these the ties that bind? Or are these the kind of ties that we've been trying to use? And if we look at the history of bin Laden, he lived in countries that sponsored him, that oh, protected yeah. him. Yeah, so he's not going to live in Pakistan unless he feels like he's going to be protected there. Yeah, or unless he... F I mean, clearly, there was, without a shadow of a doubt, a degree of support for him in Pakistan. I mean, forget the popular support, um, but there's a degree of support for him in Pakistan. Now... Is that rogue elements? Is it just individuals? Is it part of a certain strategy? Who knows? Um, but clearly, to have a facility that they're saying is eight times larger than any other residents in that sort of area, right there under the nose of the West Point Duntroon, I mean, it really does ask far too many questions now, doesn't it? But what you have to do is you have to look at the degree of Pakistan's interest. It also seems, I don't know, today I read that Salman Rushdie um, wrote a column saying that he thinks that America should now declare Pakistan a terrorist state, and what all that means is if somehow that's going to solve any of the problems here. I mean, the relationship, as you say, Michael, between the US and Pakistan has been dysfunctional, as it has been with Australia as well. But isn't there a point to be made that the people who are going to probably suffer now from this killing of bin Laden are going to be Pakistani civilians, who are going to be probably killed by an Afghan civilians and others in large numbers in retaliation for what has happened. I mean, it's going to be them rather than the well, establishment. The, but the response to that is, so what? Yeah. Who cares? No, Do you I, think... I, I, I agree with you. you know, I agree. But I'm like, saying, yeah. Are any of us, you know, as nations in Afghanistan to help the rights of women? Yeah. To really bring democracy, to give them a, a, a health system? No. We're only there because of perceived national strategic interests. And we're servicing those interests as we see fit. So, hey. Which is why when you see Gillard yesterday come out and rather say, you know, we're going to stay the distance there, which is essentially what they've been saying for nine years, which is going wonderfully well for them. It's, not, it's almost well, like, like, what needs to happen, do you think, before... Sorry, we've only got 20 seconds left, so <laughs> we're, we're going what? to wrap it up. Okay. But, Michael Ware, fantastic to have you on the program. Thanks very much for coming in. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to all our guests, uh, Andy Lowenstein, Pete Hatami and David Crow. You can check out our website at abc.net.au forward slash the drum. And we'll see you at the same time tomorrow night.